This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to say a quick prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you that you are my awesome ruler, my merciful Savior, my wonderful Redeemer. And I thank you that I'm able to present myself to you a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is my reasonable service. You will have your way in Jesus. All right. So, um, I've been praying not to procrastinate. And I know that's a weakness of mine. And I've been praying for God to uh, work on me in that area, deliver me from that. And so, a couple of days ago, I had this dream that. Um, I, all I remember from the dream is just that my phone broke, like a piece of it literally broke off. It wasn't repairable. It, it like broke in half the whole phone or like a third of it broke off or something like that. And I was really sad um, because I got a lot of memos in my phone, a lot of, you know, voice recordings in my phone. So I was sad. And then yesterday during the day, I took a nap and I had a vision. And I was holding my phone. I was trying to hold my phone in my hand, but it was a force that was stronger than me that was pulling my phone away from me. So I'm, it was pulling and pulling, and I'm like trying to pull it back, and finally it just flung out of my hand, and uh, you know, it flung over into somewhere where I couldn't reach it. And I woke up and I said, "All right, Lord, what you trying to tell me about my phone?" And uh, you know, I um, I probably have been a little excessive on my phone. Uh, lately, checking emails, messaging um, people, and doing other things. And, uh, I'm pretty sure that was the God telling me, yeah, pull away. I need you to be available. I need you to be available. And so um, today I turned my phone off for two hours. Uh, I think it was a little more than two hours, but I turned it off and I was just available. And uh, the Spirit put it on my heart to share this um, chapter I had yesterday. I went to go get some pizza and it was the young man outside the pizza store and um, he was uh, trying to sell his CDs and I'm going to be honest you know, I got out of the car and I saw him trying to sell his CDs and you know I looked at him and I'm, I'm like I'm going to ask him does it work I got if he asks me about a CD and uh, I was thinking in my head if he says no then that's going to be my my exit strategy. That's how I'm gonna get out of that one. So I went in the store. He didn't ask me on my way in the store, but when I came out of the store, he was sitting down and he looked kind of discouraged and he just started talking to me. I wasn't even looking at him. He just started talking and I had to look up to know he was talking to me. And he said, um, I'm not blaspheming. My music is not blasphemous. And I'm like, okay. So while I was looking for an exit strategy, the Holy Spirit was looking for an, an entry point, an entry point. And uh, he just started talking. He just started pouring out, you know, um, some hardships that he's had in life and, and things of that nature. And I asked him, I said, well, are you saved? And he said, well, I go to church. And he, he named two churches that he go to. And uh, I let him keep talking again, and he kept saying, I, I had to do this on my own, and I had to do that on my own, and it's just been me and on my own, on my own. And he said, um, you know, I'm only out here doing this because nobody has shown me anything better. And I, one thing that stood out to me as he was talking, I let him talk, I let him express himself, but, you know, one thing that stood out to me is that if you believe there's a God and if you know anything about God, you know that you're not doing anything on your own. And uh, I said, you know, God is protecting you. God is providing for you. And maybe if you stop saying you're doing everything on your own and you start saying, Lord, I know that you're here with me. I know that you're protecting me. I know that you're a provider. Then you will start seeing doors open that you didn't even know existed. And, you know, he's saying very receptive to what I was saying. I let him talk some more. I end up buying the CD even though I don't have anywhere to play it. And at the end of the conversation, I shook his hand and I said, I believe in you. I said, God has formed you into existence for a purpose. I said, you have to seek him to find out what your purpose is. And I told him, I said, give me a hug. And he gave me a hug. And he said, thank you. He said, I don't receive that much love out here. And I said, well, God is love. And, you know, I was walking away getting into my car. But I could I could tell that he was like he was he was thinking on that that God is love 
And I was also thinking in my car, like, that's messed up if he go to a couple churches with any kind of frequency or, or, or you know, he around other believers and he never feels God's love. And I started uh, thinking about the video I posted the other day about Amos, the eighth chapter, when God says he, he was in a famine on the land where it won't be of bread and water, but it will be on here in the word of God. And I was just thinking, like, there's some people now who don't, you know, see God's love in the people around them, who don't experience God's love. And the people around them, and if that's the drawing power, because we know Christ said from my last video, I think it was John 12 and 32, if when I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And Jesus was, you know, God, God's love manifested. Then where is that loving power? Where is the loving power? Um, you know, people need to experience God's love. They need to see God's love in those people who say that they are believers of God, those people who are supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. People need to see God's love because that's what's going to increase the kingdom. That's what's going to save souls is the love. And um, this verse that I have here, it's 1 John chapter 4. Starting at the seventh verse, it says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. The other thing that the Holy Spirit showed me about that encounter with that young man the Holy Spirit kept telling me, empty is a vulnerable place to be. Empty is a vulnerable place to be. Empty is a vulnerable place to be. And, you know, he was basically, he was pouring himself out. He had just started talking. I guess, you know, maybe after being told no so many times, he was just desperate. And that's what emptiness is. That's what desperation is. They're synonymous. It, you know, we, we're vessels. God formed us from the dirt, and then we didn't become living until he breathed the breath of life into us. We are vessels that were created to be filled with some kind of force. Now, we can be filled with the loving power of God, or we can be filled with some evil spirits of, of you know, Satan's kingdom. But when our temple is empty, we're in desperation to be filled. And people will start trying to fill themselves with things or you know, with anything. People start trying to fill themselves with anything. And we're around empty people all day. So it's, it's, it's necessary, it's essential, it's important, it's detrimental, it's life-giving that we, that we um, you know, we, we act in love, that we exemplify love, that we be the light of this world, that we be the salt of this earth. That we carry God's love with us so that we can draw these people to God. So we could draw these people to Jesus. If I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. You gotta have the Holy Spirit operating in you. You gotta have that love operating in you to draw people to Christ, to make people want to serve that God that you know. So God is love and empty is a is a vulnerable place to be. Empty is uh, synonymous with desperation. You know, the woman who had the issue of blood, she was desperate for Jesus. The the tax collector, you know, he wanted to get a, a glimpse of Jesus. So in his desperation to see Jesus, he climbed up into a tree. And Jesus told him, I'm going to be staying at your place tonight. And he welcomed Jesus into his home. Uh, the friends who lowered their, uh, the man with, who had the uh, paralyzed body down into the roof, they were desperate for his healing. They believed and they were desperate. So desperate is not necessarily a bad place to be, but it's a vulnerable place to be. It's a good place to be for God to, to meet your need, for God to fill you with his Holy Spirit or to fill you with uh, you know peace, love, joy, hope, what have you. But if, some, if we are not... If, uh, the laborers, if they don't act on that harvest, if they if they don't exemplify the love, then we run the risk of the world coming to fill them up with something else. So, um, that was that. 
Well, I had one other verse in it. John 10 and 37. John 10 and 37. Don't believe me unless I carry out my Father's work. But if I do his work, believe in the evidence of the miraculous works I have done. Even if you don't believe me, then you will know and understand that the Father is in me. I am in the Father. And as far as that goes, um, you know, like if we profess God, if we say God is good or whatever, how's somebody going to believe you unless they see you? loving unless they see God's power operating in you you know some people we praising God on Sunday and the rest of the week we a wreck who don't want to serve the God you serve if they don't see his power his glory on your life nobody is going to believe you unless they say, see you doing the father's work unless they see the father's love in you unless there's a loving power drawing people to God through you and then the other thing I remember that I received in that, um, the Holy Spirit put John 10, 10 in my heart. And, uh, you know, it says, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. And my purpose is to give them the rich and satisfying life. The King, King James Version probably says something like, uh, the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. And if we think of that, and, and, and you, I remember when he told Peter, uh, Jesus told Peter, Satan has his desire to sift you like wheat. Um, yes, Satan is looking for entry points into us. He's looking for brokenness into us, to enter into us, and to birth sin with us. But just as Satan is looking for entry points into us to birth sin with us, Jesus is looking for entry points into us to birth the life in us. Jesus is looking for entry points to birth life in us. And yesterday, my flesh was looking for an exit strategy. Does your music glorify God? That was going to be my exit strategy. But when he started, you know, when he humbled himself and he started pouring himself out after I had come out of the store with the pizza in my hand, I couldn't turn away from that. I couldn't. I wanted to give him eye contact and let him know I'm listening. While I was putting the pizza in the car because I wanted to sit the pizza down, I'm like, I'm listening. When a person humbles themselves, there's something undeniable about that. Like in Psalms, what is it? Is it Psalms 51, like 16 and 17, where it says, you know, you don't desire a, a burnt offering or this or that, but the sacrifice you desire is broken spirit and a contrite heart that you will not refuse. I could not refuse that young man just pouring himself out like that. I couldn't refuse it. I couldn't, I, I felt it, it would have been unloving. It would have been disrespectful. It would have been shameful to ignore him. I couldn't ignore him. And in return, I had to tell him about God. I felt that he was in a weak spot and I had to give him all that I knew to give him. I bought his CD too. I bought his CD too, even though I don't have nowhere to play it. But I had to give him some hope. And it was just amazing how that worked. Going into the store, I was looking for an exit strategy. I had it in my head. I was going to ask him, does your music glorify God? And I figured he would say no. And I'd be like, eh, if it did, I would or what have you. But when he started just, you know, confessing and um, humbling himself, I couldn't refuse it. I couldn't refuse it. The spirit of the love in me couldn't refuse it. I seen someone who was broken in front of me. Who was empty in front of me and I just I just wanted to pour some love and hope into him I wanted him to know that there is a God who will meet any need that you have there's a God who, who loves you who wants a relationship with you there is a God who's formed you into an existence for a purpose and um, that's that so I hope that uh, you are encouraged to exemplify God's love to not turn and walk away when you see somebody who don't look like you who you know may not know God how you know God but I pray that something in you will leave them richer than before they encountered you something in you will leave them richer more hopeful more more joyful more something than before they encountered you in Jesus name
leave it at that.